urban tribes in South Africa. Bless them, O oh God. Anoint them. I pray for these fellows. I pray Paul and Kristen Matthias, it's them and their girls, in the name of Jesus. I pray for all of our troops. Bless them, O oh God. Anoint them today. Keep them safe. I pray for these in our church that have medical conditions. I pray that you'd bless them, Lord. I pray for Sharon Saunders, that you'd touch her. She now has pneumonia. But thank God she does not have a coronavirus at all, but simply pneumonia. Lord, we pray that you'd bring healing to her body. I pray for Jeff Alexander. You'd touch him as he's now home from the hospital. I pray today for, for the two families that were celebrating the lives of people who have passed on. I pray for Cynthia Armentrout and Grace Scheid as we, we have the celebration of the life of, of Charles Scheid. Lord, bless him. Bless this family today. In the, in the name of the Lord, I pray. I pray for the family of Andy Epperjesse. As we have his celebration, I pray that you'd bless him, Lord, and anoint him in the name of the Lord. Be with them, Father. I pray for these in the name of Jesus Christ that healing would happen. Father, I pray for others in our church that need healing. I pray for Amanda Shuck as she's recovering from surgery. I pray the blessings of God upon her. I pray for Lonnie Sewell that you'd touch our brother. I pray for him, Lord, as they continue treatments and may great things happen in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for their country. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd stop this coronavirus, that you'd step in, O oh Lord, and do great and mighty things in the in the way, in the realm of the miraculous, Lord, may the people back up and say, surely the hand of God has been upon America and upon our world. So, Lord, we just humble ourselves to you and ask for healing in the name of Jesus, our master. Amen. Well, I want to bring the word of God to you today. A friend of mine in East Texas sent us a, uh, a, a Facebook posting I want to share with you. He said, I trust God, but I wear my seatbelt. I trust God, and I wear a motorcycle helmet. I trust God and there's enough life jackets in my boat for everyone on board. I trust God, but I use oven mitts when I take out hot plates. I trust God and then I look at my house. I lock my house at night. I trust God and I have smoke detectors in my house. I trust, trust God, but I take prescribed medicines. I trust God and I will follow the best guidelines to share the task of flat, flattening the curve of this virus in our country. Acting with caution and with wisdom does not indicate a lack of trust in God. I repeat that and say amen to my brother who shared that with us because we don't want to put people in danger or try to do anything to continue the, 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 the spread of this virus. So that's why we're doing church online. Uh, we will this way for the next couple of weeks. We, uh, I sent out an email to tell you that we were not having any activities at the church until at least April 1st at church services or activities or anything. And the office hours are going to be very, very limited. So you better be call, calling before you come up here because there may not be anybody here. We're going to be home trying to keeping our social distance. And if we do come up, we're going to try to stay six feet apart. Only because we want to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with and, and our health. I want to finish the message today that I started three weeks ago. And I didn't, don't know why I was sharing the message. As a matter of fact, I know where it came from. But it kind of just arose as the coronavirus So this this uh, uh, situation in America rose up. This, this came out of the, the fact that Nashville had a massive uh, tornado. People died. They lost their lives. And then we ended up with Jeff Alexander, who was in the hospital with bacterial meningitis and a coma. Several other things happened in our church that made me think, you know, we've been through some devastation. Uh, we were talking about the family that came home from China and had to stay home and restart their career here because they couldn't go back to China. We, uh, we want to, this is where the message came from. We're looking at Nehemiah today because I want to look at, at how we can rebuild. We talked to, um, we talked about the, uh, the, the rescuing stage, the resuming stage, and then finally we ended up with the rebuilding stage. So we started talking about the rebuilding stage because those were the three stages that, that happen after a major crisis or a major tri uh, trial or a major catastrophe. So it's amazing that, um, that we're in, in, in our society today, we're having to rebuild from a, from a tragedy that we've never, never thought about. Matter of fact, I was, listening, was reading an, an article this morning from a friend who said that if this tragedy continues, we will lose good possibility of having, of having the uh, possibility of losing three times as many people as we lost in World War II. As President Trump said this week, we're in war. We're in war against a virus. We're in a war of, of many things. So we want to do our part and follow God's word. So I've started this whole message by talking about the, the, the ways we can have to rebuild after a major, 
major crisis and major tra tragedy. And please bear with me because I'm not a TV preacher, don't want to be, have never intended to be. I'm more of a walk down the aisles and touch you a little bit, but it's tough on us pastors, old school pastors who like to be right there with you, and it's just not the time of year or the time of season of our life to do that. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. We talked about ways that we can rebuild. One of them was release the grief. We talked about how the, um, in this time, of, especially in this time, we've got so much building up on top of us. We end up with emotions that we don't know how to handle. Uh, I was almost in tears just walking across the building to come to speak to you today because I feel this overwhelming sense of pastoral compassion for you guys. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be safe. But at the same time, I want you to be all here together, huddled in a big group here at Grace. But we're finding out that's not the best. So you stay home and know that we love you. We're praying for you. But we want you to handle the emotions. Uh, you, you have to release those. You have to don't rehearse them. You have to release those those feelings, those emotions that you have, especially grief. Grief. So we want to talk about that. Release the grief. Our second point in our sermon we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Uh, matter of fact, if you want to go online, you can see some of the older sermons and see where I came from. Uh, the number two is you've got to release the bitterness. It's going to be very hard for us to get rid of the bitterness that we can have built up in our lives because of a tragedy. Uh, I was uh, made aware this morning of somebody that brought the virus from overseas and it infected some of our Assemblies of God mission leaders. And I thought, well, how in the world could he? And I almost got bitter at him for doing that. But then I thought he did not know that, and I need to ha not have any bitterness at all towards anybody who's doing anything for the kingdom of God. But let me also share with you, I thought, here are two of our AG mission leaders that, re that are sick today. One of them has been tested positive for corona, and they were doing God's work in God's place in God's timing that still receive the blessing, so still receive this virus. So we need to be cautious. We need to be very cautious in terms of what we're doing. But we need to resist the bitterness. I've talked to people who said they get bitter over things that happen or tragedy. I'm sure there are some people that, uh, that got bitter in Nashville when they lost their houses, and they probably got bitter, and they probably got bitter at God. So we've got to do that. We've got to release the bitterness and get it past us and don't let it hold us. Because somebody once said that when you... When you don't release the bitterness and you try not to keep score, your body will keep score. So remember that. Number third is to, is to re, uh, reevaluate. I think we need to reevaluate where we are, what we have as Americans, what we have as Christians, what we have as people in this country, and what we have with our health. We need to back up and reevaluate. I remember the young man sitting on the steps of his, of his slab in Nashville. He said, I lost my house, but I have my life. I think we need to realize that we don't, shouldn't confuse what's important with what's really important. Um, it's amazing to me that I stopped by the Kroger yesterday to have, the, have something to pick up some stuff, and the shelves are empty, and all of a sudden the stuff that we took for granted is now very valuable. But we need to realize that even those things are not as valuable. We need to reevaluate what's important. We were talking through the sermons last couple of weeks about the Spanish Baptist Church in Dallas that lost their building. And he came back and he said, yes, but, but uh, none of our people were lost. We can move to a new building. We can have worship there. So uh, we're excited. And I was talking the other day about how that uh, in, uh, in Nashville, there are a lot of very valuable guitars under a pile of rubble. So we need to reevaluate re our lives, what's important. Uh, we talked the other day about you can lose your career. Sure you can. You can lose a, a bank account. You can lose loved ones. You can use your... Lose your youthful beauty. So we need to reevaluate as we go through this tragedy, this trial. Number four, you can receive help from other people. We talked about, and last week I talked about the families of our church that get together and are small groups and encourage one another. So that's the way you rebuild from a tragedy. You do it in small groups. It's important that you get friends. And you may not have hundreds and hundreds of friends, but you need two or three that you can bring around you. And, and I illustrated that with the the group of the mud runners, and I congratulated them, and they even blessed me by giving me a, a, a T-shirt and a medal that said I was one of the mud runners, and I appreciate that. I probably, I probably will never run in the mud, but they accepted me and included me. You need to let people into your world and, 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 and let people get close to you. You can only get help, and you can only rebuild when you reevaluate and then you reestablish relationships with other people and, and let other people help you very important that we do that 
we need to keep moving on. I, I read a, an article the other day, and I don't, I don't remember whether, I think I read it last week from Max Lucado. Um, Max Lucado said that Jesus, many people, is small enough to be contained in an aquarium that fits on a cabinet. He never causes trouble or demands attention. If you want a goldfish bowl full of Jesus, steer clear of the real Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't make you sexy or skinny or clever. Jesus make, can make you uh, what you see in the mirror. He changes how you see what you see. We talked about that. We need to rely on one another and encourage one another. Number five in our ser service and our sermon on rebuilding after a tragedy is to rely on God. You receive help from others. You rely on God. There are five qualities to rebuild your life. You've got to have peace and you have to have hope wisdom, courage, and strength. Uh, these five things you must have. We've got to have these things in our life. First is peace. The Lord says, peace I give you. Peace I leave with you. Psalms chapter 62 tells us our second thing, and that's hope. Psalm 62 says, I find rest in God. Only he gives me hope. As we're rebuilding, we're going to need peace. We need to cast our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. We need to trust on him. We need to turn to him for our peace. He will give you a peace that even goes beyond your understanding. You won't even know why you're so peaceful. I pray for that. We need hope. Everybody needs hope. We need that. Psalms chapter 62 says, where do I get from? I find rest in God. Only he gives me hope. Psalms 33, you are my shield, my wonderful God who gives me courage. That's the third thing you're going to need to rebuild your life. Not only peace and hope, but you're going to need courage. Matter of fact, the last thing I want to share, there's two more things, but one of them is wisdom. You're going to need wisdom. And then you're going to need strength. Isaiah 12 says, he will give you strength to rebuild your life. God is my Savior, and I will trust in him, and I will not be afraid. Notice all these gifts he gives you. Through this time of rebuilding, through this tragedy, and through this strategic pandemic, we're going to have to rely on the Lord and let him trust us and, and let him help us. The way you handle fear, the way you handle loss, the way you handle tragedy um, is going to make a difference. Somebody said that the way they handle the typhoons of South Pacific Islands and the islanders themselves, they'll tie themselves to a tree, something that cannot be moved in the midst of the storm. So during this storm, you're going to have to tie yourself to a tree, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the rock. He is the rock, totally. Now, number six, and we're going to move on to kind of close up. Number six is we've got to refuse to be discouraged. It would be very easy for us to be discouraged through this season, this time in our lives, when we look at everything that's going wrong and there's not even enough toilet paper and there's no meat in the, in the freezers at the, at the grocery store, we need to realize we should not get discouraged. You know God has a plan for you, God has a purpose for you, and it's greater than your problem. So we need to realize that. Um, we, no, we need not get discouraged. Notice Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, by standing firm, you will gain life. Standing firm. Don't get discouraged. Stand firm with where you are right now. The word refused is, it means it's a choice. So you can choose today when you hear this sermon, you can choose whether you get discouraged in the, in the midst of all this or you can rejoice and enjoy church online and sleep in this morning. I pray every one of you, as you got ready for church this morning, you got up a cup of coffee or a, a good chocolate shake and you sat down with your biscuits and gravy and you enjoyed a great time worshiping the Lord. I appreciate Brianna coming up and leading us in worship and and, and leading us to the throne of grace. And we're going to have a time of prayer in just a moment. But you don't look to the Lord. You don't get to, uh, you, you look to the Lord. You don't look to the things around you. Don't get discouraged. I pray, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help our people. I pray for the grace people, that you would not get discouraged. In the midst of all this, sometimes we can let our minds run wild. And you've heard my stories. If you hear the story of the three sillies, you'll know, you'll know that if you remember any of my illustrations, remember that. Don't let your mind run wild on what's going to go bad or what's going to go wrong. But at this, as of this morning coming into the church, there were only five people in all of Denton County who had tested positive. We've got to do our best, but we can let our minds run wild and get discouraged with what might happen. Don't do that. Please don't do that. And then number seven, you've got to reach out to help other people. Uh, I think that is so crucial because in the time of rebuilding and getting excited, we've got to pray for others, we've got to give to help others, and we've got to become a blessing. As I was thinking about this um, this morning and thinking about Nehemiah, our exercises gave him the blessing to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. He was to rebuild from a tragedy. Uh, and remember when I said he had to cry out to God. Nehemiah cried out to God and said, 
How can I live in, in exile when my city is in ruins? I want you to help us, O oh God. So you cry out to God. But then what he did was, with the leadership of Artaxerxes to go back, he got letters so that every place he went going home, it have protection, it have supplies, it have the abilities to go accomplish God's purpose. So I, I was challenged this morning when I saw that because, you know, sometimes we think we can do it. We think we can handle every problem that comes down our path, but we need to rely on other people. We need to rely on God. We need to connect with one another, but then we need to reach out and help other people as well. I appreciate those in our church who have volunteered to take groceries. So if any of our seniors need, need something at home, call the church. Or we gave you two phone numbers to call, and you can call those people, and we'll try to get groceries to you or whatever you need. If we can find it, we want to help you. If you're not feeling well or need to go somewhere, call one of those people or call the church office. Our church office uh, will notify us if you have a need or if you need to speak to one another. You have most of our cell phone numbers, so just contact us. Even if we're not in the office, we're here to minister to you, and we want you to minister to other people. I pray today that you'll spend some time in prayer for our country, for our, for our world. I pray that you would pray for the health of our, of our world, but pray for, for grace. I pray that you would do all that you can. We need to be able to, to reach out and help other people. Some of you may want to reach out and check on your friends and, and your other people in your neighborhood. You need to reach out to them. It's important that we do that. I was reminded of the song by John Newton, who uh, in the midst of a big storm, he wrote Amazing Grace. He had a life that was uh, raised in, in slave trade and even captained a boat in the slave trade industry. But yet God saved him and redeemed him and brought him back. Um, I was reading that article just this morning about John Newton. Um, what a great, great person he was. And on, on that day uh, that I received this report, uh, on the, the day of the storm, take that back, on the day of the storm, he turned his life over to the Lord and readjusted his, his whole life. He was born in 1725. But it said Newton eventually became a disciple of George Whitfield, Whitfield and came to, ad, to admire John Wesley and himself, taught himself Latin and Greek and Hebrew and surrendered to the call of ministry. He finally wrote over 280 hymns and changed the world with his, with his leadership, even his pastoral ministry who touched William Wilberforce, who we know was a great leader in the revival movement. So there are things that you can do to reach out to other people, regardless of the, of the tr crisis you're in, or what's going on, you can do that. I was, I'm going to share with you one other thought. I've got so much material that I've received. It's been, it's been amazing. If nothing else through this crisis, we've seen the rise of a lot of people writing good things. I read this article the other day about, uh, from C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis pointed out 72 years ago. He said, we should not exaggerate the novelty of our situation. In other words, people throughout history have faced difficult situations unpleasant deaths, hardship, so we should not go about whimpering, quote, whimpering and drawing long faces because of the scientists have added one more uh, chance of a painful and a premature death to a world that's already bristling with such chances into which death itself is not a chance but a certainty. So we shouldn't get all discouraged and we shouldn't get all depressed uh, over the, this virus and what it's doing to our world. We need to realize that this didn't catch God off guard an opportunity for, for the sin factor to come back and take us into the next life, which we're going to anyway. But I pray today that you reach out and help other people. Reach out and help others through this coronavirus. Check on people. I told you a couple of weeks ago to write a card to somebody. So I want you to do that for me today. I want you to reach out and love on somebody. Call somebody. You can pray for somebody and help them. So as we look at the children of Israel, Nehemiah wanted to rebuild after a tragedy. The city was torn down. His people, but the city of God was not where it should be, was not in standing like it needed to be. But the Lord spoke to him. He cried out to God. The Lord arranged for him to go through our Xerxes back to rebuild the temple. So I pray that you'll remember these seven things. Next week we'll come back and hopefully we'll have another message for you. I just can't get away from this, pa this passage of Scripture. It's just stayed heavy on my heart. We need to continue to look at ways that we can reach out and rebuild. And we are going to have to rebuild. Right now we're still in the rescuing and, the, and the, re, re, uh, the earlier stages of tragedy. And we want to rescue. So we want to do our part. I appreciate you staying home, staying out of, the, out of the way of anybody else. We don't want anybody else sick. I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, we may close our office.